Okay, chapter 11, Assisted Delivery and Cesarean Birth. We're going to be talking in this section about C-sections, induction of labor, and any kind of assistance with the delivery, forceps, vacuum, extractor, all of those things. So we'll jump on into it. Elective induction. Okay, so this has become more popular recently, and it's um, one where it's just, we've seen a huge increase in the number of inductions. It can be any reason from the doctors going out of town on vacation, the woman wants to have her doctor there deliver the baby, so they go ahead and set an induction date before he goes out of town. Uh, it can be post-date. She's 41 weeks. She is ready to get that baby out, so we're going to go ahead and induce. Um, more often with induction, it's going to result in more in interventions, more um, longer labors, higher costs, and then there's always going to be the possibility of a cesarean birth. If the induction doesn't work, if they have contractions on top of each other, hyperactive uterus, we will have to do a cesarean birth. So there's always risk involved. Possible indications for it induction of labor. Post-state pregnancy. She's past 40 weeks. She is ready to get that baby out. It can be anywhere from even 38 to 42 weeks, somewhere in that time period. She has a premature rupture of membranes. Her water breaks early and she hasn't had contractions start with it. Um, we would go ahead and induce her and try and get those contractions started on their own. Uh, sometimes you'll have a spontaneous rupture of membranes, but you won't have any contractions. The longer that your water has been broken, the longer that you do not have those membranes intact, it puts you at higher risk for infection. So we can only let them go a couple of hours, like 24 hours before we'll go ahead and start inducing and trying to get that labor started for them. Chorioamnitis is uh, infection of those membranes and so we would go ahead and try and get the baby out, get the uh, delivery started. Pregnancy induced hypertension, if her blood pressure keeps going up or with the preeclampsia her blood pressure is up, she's spilling protein in the urine, we would go ahead and induce labor and try and get that baby out. Remember the only cure to preeclampsia is to deliver the baby. And then if the baby is suffering with fetal growth restriction, she, if that child, that baby has severe intrauterine fetal growth restriction, that means that the baby isn't growing and it's not getting big enough. And so we would go ahead and try and deliver the baby for that reason. And then any kind of maternal medical conditions, if she's having epilepsy, if she has um, heart conditions, heart disease, diabetes, anything like that, and it's causing the mother to be at risk, we would go ahead and get that labor started for her. There are, however, some contraindications with it. We talked about placenta previa, and if you have a complete placenta previa, that means that placenta is covering that external oz. In that case, you would not labor um, a woman. You cannot labor her. She would end up hemorrhaging out. So for that, it's always going to be a C-section. If the woman has a history of a classical uterine incision, now remember that there are two incisions. There's one on the skin, but there's one also on the uterus, and we have to know what incision that woman has on her uterus. And if it's a classical high uterine incision, we will not labor her. She has too, too high of risk to um, have that incision uh, tear apart, so we would not do it in that way. If she has any kind of structural abnormalities of the pelvis, if she was once a CPD, a cephalopelvic disproportion, she will always be a CPD and she will always have to have um, a C-section. She will not be able to labor the baby. Invasive cervical cancer, medical conditions such as active herpes, genital herpes, we will not labor that woman. And then fetal contradictions, certain anomalies like hydrocephalus, where that sac, that the neuro, neurological sac has, is on the outside, it's not covered up, it hasn't been closed off. Of course, we wouldn't be able to labor that baby because it would rupture that sac. And then other certain fetal male pr 
presentations, if it's a transverse lie, you cannot labor that baby. And any kind of fetal compromise, if that baby is not doing well, we won't labor the baby. We'll go ahead and take them C-section. So induction of labor, you have to have labor readiness, and there's a prerequisite for um, induced labor, and that's going to be a ripe cervix. If her cervix is not ripe and we try and induce her, she will not she will not take it well. She will not be able to labor, and oftentimes that will lead to a C-section. So we have this thing called the Bishop score, and it's often used to determine the readiness of labor. There's five factors that are evaluated. Each factor can score from zero to three. A score of eight or greater is associated with a successful oxytocin-induced labor. So if she gets an eight or greater, then she should do fine with induction. However, if her score is five or less, that's going to say that the cervix is not ripe, it's not ready, and oftentimes it's associated with an unsuccessful induction of labor. Uh, you can look on box 11.1 for the Bishop score. This is also one, and so you can see where you have the score over here, 0 through 1, 2, 3. In each one, you have cervical dilation, effacement, station of the baby, cervical position, and then cervical consistent consistency. So you go through that, you add up your score, and that allows you to know what her bishop score is. Okay, so labor readiness again. They can also do a transvaginal ultrasound, and this is kind of a relatively new method that they use, but as long as the cervix measures 27 centimeters or less, that's a pretty good indicator that she will do fine, um, even despite the bishop score. And they'll also measure the fetal fibronectin levels. This is a newer method as well. Its presence in cervical secretions is associated with labor readiness. More often used as a predictor of preterm labor though. Not really, we don't use that much for induction of labor. And then the fetus should be mature. Several ways to assess fetal maturity. They have to be at least 38 weeks gestation to be considered mature. Now, granted, sometimes with this induction, we don't always get it right. We don't always get their age right. And so they can be too young for induction and then that often leads to a cesarean if they're not ready. Uh, date fetal heart tones was first heard. Other pregnancy milestones, fetal lung maturity is the major point of consideration. So we have to do tests to make sure that, that the fetal lung um, lungs are mature. And the way we do that is called an LS ratio and it lengthens pheno, sphenoglomylin, which you can call it LS, that's what I'm gonna call it. And it's a two to one ratio. If it's two to one, then the baby's lungs are mature and they should do fine um, with being delivered. So methods of cervical ripening. There's other methods besides just pitocin and oxytocin. And before we even start oxytocin, we have to make sure that that cervical is ripe. It's ready to have a baby. And so here are some methods that we can use for that. There's membrane stripping. And what that is is that um, you have the sac, you have your cervix, and the doctor will do a vaginal check and he will go right around the internal oz and he will just kind of strip those membranes or the external oz and he'll run his fingers around and he'll strip the membranes and what happens is that sac kind of breaks away and as it does it releases um, progesterone and so that can sometimes induce labor and start making her go into natural labor. Um, inserting a catheter into the cervix and inflating the balloon, that can cause dilation of the cervix. So that's another natural method. They'll stick a catheter up her uh, cervix and they will inflate the balloon and they'll just let that balloon sit there. And as the balloon kind of starts coming out, that weight will um, naturally dilate that woman's cervix. There are cervical dilators, uh, laminaria, You'll hear of seaweed laminaria, and they used to use that more often, but you don't see it a whole lot anymore. They'll put um, a small dilator, a laminaria, up into her cervix, and as she is leaking fluid, as she is leaking um, just normal mucosis from the cervix, it will start expanding and dilating as well. Again, don't see that quite as much. 
Pharmacological methods, there are pr prostaglandin E2, um, dinoprostone, and then prostaglandin E1, misoprostol. And they still kind of use those, and what that's doing is just making that cervix ripe, making that cervix tissue um, soft. Oftentimes, uh, with any of these methods, they'll leave um, these prostaglandins, they'll leave them up in the cervix for a little bit, and allowing it to just sit there and try and soften that cervix. Um, sometimes it can cause contractions of those smooth muscles and that will also cause the cervical ripening. Uh, Cytotec is something that the doctors will use and that comes in a pill form and they'll again just insert it right into the cervix. It makes that cervix soften up where it will be ready to dilate. Um, anytime you're doing these procedures, you're always concerned about the baby, you're checking the fetal heart rate, making sure that none of these things are causing the baby stress. Uh, artificial rupture of membranes. This is also called an amniotomy. It's where they use, where the doctor does a cervical check and he inserts the um, amniotomy tool that looks like a crochet hook, runs it along your membranes and kind of snags that sac. It will cause artificial rupture of membranes. Her water will break. She will um, release that water, that amniotic fluid. Now, there used to be this um, myth called a dry birth, like the woman would have a dry birth, and that was saying that there wouldn't be amni amniotic fluid and to help assist the baby. That is actually not true. It is a myth. There isn't anything there's no such thing as a dry birth. Even after the woman has her water broke, that baby is still sitting in quite a bit of water, quite a bit of amniotic fluid, and the mother continues to produce that amniotic fluid until the baby is delivered. Um, this will also cause the body to release prostaglandins. Anytime her water breaks, it releases those prostaglandins, and that enhances the labor. Now, the next thing we're talking about is oxytocin induction, and that is an actual IV um, oxytocin or pitocin. It's the most common agent used to induce labor. We, you have to have it on an infusion pump. You'll start at a very small dose, one milliunit per minute, and then you're gonna titrate it up every one to two millimeters per minute until an adequate contraction pattern is established. Now there are some risks involved with this and some of the po possible complications. Of course, the first would be a high risk, high risk of a C-section. The next one could be hyperstimulation of the uterus. That oxytocin is just causing contraction after contraction after contraction, and your body isn't having time to rest during those contractions. Of course, we talked about how during a contraction, that placenta is squeezed, and so the nutrients, the blood, is not getting to the baby, and that can cause the baby to go into distress. Um, water intoxication is another um, side effect of Pitocin. Pitocin acts as an antidiuretic hormone and so sometimes it will make your kidneys not shut down but temporarily kind of stop and hold on to water so you can have water toxation which could cause hyponatremia, confusions, convulsions, and a coma. So if you start seeing her get confused and she's not really um, going to the bathroom, her catheter, she's not does not have adequate urine output per hour and you start seeing some confusion, this is one thing that you would be worried about. It would be water intoxication. Okay, so as an, as an LPN, your role during the induction depends upon the procedure. You can assist with pelvic exams in mechanical ripening of the cervix or the amniotomy. Of course, as a student, like I've said before, you do not do any vaginal exams. Um, document the fetal heart rate before and after the amniotomy. This is huge. This is um, when that when that doctor goes in and he ruptures the membranes. Depending on where that baby is, if it's at a negative station up high above the ischial spines, that baby when you rupture that membrane, it will fall. The fluid fl flows out, and that baby will descend with that. Now, the thing that we worry about and the way, the reason that we're monitoring the heart rate so closely is that if that cord gets at that head and 
that baby falls, you could compress that cord. And so we have to watch for that. A big risk with an amniotomy is cord compression, prolapsed cord. That cord comes out into um, the vaginal area. And if that were to happen, we would assist the woman back, laying back, back, hugging her knees up tight, pushing that baby's head up off of the cord, and it would be an emergency C-section. So um, that is why we want to document the fetal heart rate before and after an amniotomy very closely. Superpubic or fundal pressure during the procedure, if trained, that can kind of help um, release some of the tension, some of the pressure that she is feeling. And then the RN is going to be responsible for monitoring the mother and the baby during the pharmacological ripening of the cervix. Any of those um, agents that we just talked about, if they are used, the RN is usually going to be the one who is responsible for the assessment of that mother. Episiotomy is a surgical incision made into the perineum to enlarge the vaginal opening. You'll see a picture of it on 242. Research shows a higher incidence of perineal tear into the anal sphincter when the doctor has to go in and actually cut. Again, it goes back to some people say that tearing is better, it heals faster, and then um, you will still see that some doctors are going to go ahead and make the cut. Uh, Either way, if it needs repair, you'll use a local anesthesia and absorbent sutures, which the doctor will do after they deliver the baby. Um, methods to minimize the need for episiotomy. Kegel exercises during pregnancy will strengthen those perineal muscles. Using natural pushing techniques, and particularly the side laying position, patients with the delivery process. I've told you once, but I'll tell you again. Those nurses will be in there and they will be massaging that perineum the whole time as she's pushing. They're going to be massaging that perineum to help it stretch and help the woman during the process of labor. Protection of the perineum immediately before birth to avoid any kind of uncontrolled delivery of the fetal head. Again, they're always watching that perineum to make sure that it is stretching properly. Okay, now we're talking about assisted deliveries, and this is going to be a vacuum assisted delivery. A suction cup is placed on the fetus's head, and the suction is applied and used to deliver the de deliver the infant. Okay, this can be hazardous to the infant, it can cause scalp trauma, subglial and intracranial hemorrhaging, bleeding in the brain. Pressures should not ever exceed over 600 um, millimeters of mercury and they should not ever be more than three to four pop-offs. So that's something as the LBN you'll be watching. You'll make sure that the pressure doesn't exceed 600 and then that there are no more than three to four pop-offs and that's when the suction cup pops off of the head. If there's more than three or four you're done with that you're going to try something else and then the vacuum sh also should not be applied longer than 20 to 30 minutes. Okay, forceps. Forceps are instruments with these curved, blunted blades. I mean, it looks like salad tongs. You're going in there and you're trying to pull the baby out, assist her in some of the um, pushing. Sometimes it's the woman just gets too tired, she can't push anymore, and so that's why we sometimes have to assist in the delivery. So these blades are placed around the head and the, of the fetus to facilitate a delivery. Um, there's different si types of forceps. The low and outlet forceps are going to be the more common ones. Um, mid forceps are sometimes used to assist the fetus to rotate to an anterior position. We talked yesterday about posterior, where it's that face um, is coming, the face is facing upward. You want the back of the head to come out first. You want the back of the head to be facing towards the ceiling. The back of the head um, or the face should be at the posterior side of the mother. So sometimes we'll try and rotate to that anterior position to help facilitate a easier pregnancy, an easier delivery for the mother. And then maternal indications include the fatigue. She's just pushed for too long. She's too tired. She can't do it any longer. Or if she has a harder lung disease, we can sometimes um, help pull the baby out that way. And then uh, indications or contraindications, if you had any kind of um, fetal distress, 
we would not continue this. We would have to do an emergency C-section. Okay, so complications of operative vaginal delivery. Neonatal cephalohematoma, hematoma, blood, blood on the skull, blood on the brain, retinal subdermal subglial hemorrhage um, can often occur with the vacuum extraction. And then face, facial bruising, facial nerve injury, skull fractures, and seizure, seizures are often more common with forceps. Maternal complications, you can have the extension of that episiotomy into the anal sphincter, so that would mean that she was tearing all the way from her vagina to her anal sphincter, which is very, very painful. Uterine rupture, perineal pain, laceration, hematomas, urinary retention, it can often cause swelling in the urethras, and so she's not able to urinate like she should anemia and then rehospitalization. So anytime there are any um, interventions applied for a delivery, you're also going to have um, some contraindications with that. You're going to have some complications with that as well. You can just expect that. So we try and stay away from it the best we can. However, it used to be where if you didn't have C-section, you didn't have any of these things, the baby or the mother could die. So now we have them and we try and use them um, only when necessary. It's a good thing we have them, it saves lives, but at the same time it can cause complications as well. Okay, so nursing care during an assisted delivery. You're going to obtain all the needed supplies. If the doctor needs the vacuum, you're going to go get the vacuum, you're going to get the suction, you're going to get the forceps, whatever it is he needs, you're going to get it all set up for him. You're going to monitor the maternal and fetal status before, during, and after the process. You're constantly watching the fetal heart tones. You're listening for them, you're watching them, you're making sure that baby is not in distress. You're going to assist the birth attendant, you're going to provide support for the mother, you're going to document the type of procedure, document maternal and fetal response during the procedure and after the procedure. Okay, so cesarean birth. It's the delivery of the fetus through the abdominal and uterine incisions. Um, we used to not have it, so now we have it. We try not to use it unless it's completely indicated. Um, it has saved many lives. History of previous cesarean birth. If she's had a cesarean birth before, we'll usually go ahead and give her um, a second cesarean birth. Labor dystocia, failure to progress in labor. Either her contractions just stopped, we can't get the baby to descend, she's not dilating any further, and the baby is having some distress, which would be a non-reassuring fetal status. Um, those are indications of why we would go ahead and get the baby out. And then fetal male pre presentation. If the baby is lying transverse, there's no way of that baby coming out. It would have to rotate, and at this point, she's just too far along. It's not going to happen. Incidents, in 2006, the number went up to 30, 31.1% of births by cesarean delivery, and that's the highest rate that has ever been reported in the United States. 2009, it was 32.9, and it was estimated to go up in 2020 to 56.2. And so when we are teaching about cesarean births, we've got to help women realize that they, this is a major surgery and there are huge risks involved. We're grateful that we can do it now, but at the same time, it should not be the first option. And we've got to remind them of all the risks that go, that are involved with major surgery. Um, major surgery carries with it all the risk involved associated with surgery combined with the risk of birth itself so not only are you having a major surgery but you also have risk of birth you have the risk of postpartum hemorrhage you have so many risks involved three times more likely to die by cesarean birth than a natural birth so women need to know that they need to hear that three times more likely to die by cesarean than um, vaginal birth Normal physiological changes of pregnancy are amplified, and there are some surgical risk factors. Inadvertent delivery of a premature fetus, sometimes we don't always know for sure how old that fetus is. And if we guess wrong on the dates and that baby is too young, they'll have respiratory distress. 
um, national goal is to decrease the cesarean delivery rate. Hopefully we never get up to 56.2 in 2020. Um, there are maternal complications that go along with it. Laceration of the uterine artery, bladder, bladder ur ureter, or bowel. You are making an incision, the doctor is making an incision, and anytime that happens, there is the risk of cutting something else besides what he's intending to. Hemorrhaging require, requiring a blood transfusion, and anytime you give blood, there is always risk involved in that as well. A hysterectomy, infection, pneumonia, postpartum hemorrhage, rhombophilitis, uh, and other surgery-related complications. Okay, so with the fetal complications, the most common is going to be an unintended delivery of an immature fetus because of miscalculations of dates, which will cause respiratory distress because of the re retained lung fluid. Again, you want that vaginal squeeze. You want the vaginal squeeze to squeeze out that extra fluid in the lungs to make those alveolas pop open and to help that baby get that first breath of life. That is going to be the best thing for the child. Depressed fetal respiratory drive due to anesthesia. They do have to use anesthesia and this can sometimes make it difficult for the newborn to take his or her first breath. And then there's always the risk of fetal injury. Incision types. So here's where we talk about the abdominal incisions. Abdominal incisions, you can have that vertical approach done in the middle, midline of the lower abdomen, or you can have the bananestals incision, we call it the bikini cut, and that's the most preferred one. It's going to be lower, which does put you at um, more risk for bleeding, however, it is the preferred method, and that's the one that most surgeons use. Now, this abdominal incision is the one on the skin. However, we also have to talk about the uterine incision, and you can have the classical incision, which is gonna be higher up. You can have a low cervical vertical incision, which is still gonna be that straight up and down vertical incision, it's just a little bit lower. Or now, the approach that most prefer is gonna be that low cervical transverse incision, and that is the preferred method. What you hope for is that they're going to do the same cut on the skin as well as the uterus. But that wasn't always the case. They used to make just any kind of incision in the abdomen to, or not in the abdomen, but, but the uterus to get that baby out fast. So a lot of times it was up and down. And if that's the case, if that's the incision, you will never um, labor that woman. She'll always have to have a cesarean birth. And they still sometimes have to do that classical incision if it's an emergency C-section and they've got to get that baby out quick. Otherwise, you, you, you won't see that much. Okay, so steps in the cesarean delivery. Well, you have the preoperative period. And with the preoperative phase, you're going to have a very much a team approach. It's you call the OR, tell them we're coming, get the consent signed, and get everything ready. Um, Interoperative phase, as the LVN, you can act as the scrub nurse. You won't usually be the one assessing the patient while she's on anesthesia. You'll leave, that will be the RN's responsibility. And then postoperative phase, the LVN can assume care of the woman after she's sufficiently recovered from anesthesia. Again, the RN will be the one to recover from anesthesia. Once she's cleared from that, you can take over. So nursing care, plan cesarean, we're going to be focusing on the family, preparing the family for the birth. However, with an emergency cesarean birth, it's supportive behavior. It's trying to help her work through this. It's probably not what she wished for, but if you'll explain the procedures as they're being done, explain that the baby is doing okay, or walking her through what is taking place, she'll feel more in control and um, just have more reassurance in that. And then we're going to be providing care in the immediate post-operative phase, which has many factors going into that. Okay, so as we talked about with the incision, there is the possibility that you could still have a vaginal birth after a C-section. However, there are prerequis prerequisites with this. You, one, you have to have the adequate pelvis, that gynecoid pelvis, the female pelvis that is round that allows um, the baby's head to come through. You can't have any previous uterine ruptures. If your uterus has ever ruptured, um, meaning that that sac, that uterus sac, broke open before, 
you will never be able to have a vaginal birth. Personnel and facilities have to be available to perform an immediate cesarean delivery because you are at risk for rupturing. No more than one previous low transverse uterine scar. So you can have a uterine, a low transverse uterine scar, meaning that on the uterus it is um, an up and down incision, but it has to be low. The higher it is, the higher your chances are for ruptured. You have to have signed informed consent listing the benefits and the risk. Surgeon, anesthesia provider, and the operating personnel have to be in the hospital ready to go for an emergency C-section if that were to take place. And then the practitioner who can read and interpret electrofetal monitoring tracings and recognize any signs and symptoms of uterine rupture. That would be like um, all of a sudden the abdomen cavity has kind of gone flat and you can see the baby's outline, meaning that the sac has ruptured, the amniotic fluid has ruptured inside the body and that baby is encased inside there. Um, of course, that is an emergency thing. It puts you at risk for sepsis. It puts you at risk for fetal demise. And it can, if not treated quickly, cause the mother to die as well. Uh, contraindications, if you've ever had that previous C-section uterine scar, that big, long uterine scar, you will always have to have um, a c-section after that. Placenta previa, we've talked about that. History of previous uterine rupture. If you've ever ruptured before, you cannot have a vaginal birth after a c-section. And then if the, there's a lack of facilities or equipment to perform an immediate cesarean, you would not be able to have a vaginal birth. Okay, so the risk and the benefits. Greatest concern is going to be that uterine rupture. Risk is amplified when prostaglandins are used to ripen that cervix before it induction with oxytocin. If you've ever had a history of more than one cesarean, a short interval between pregnancies, that's just your body has not recovered fully. The muscles haven't been able to tighten back up, um, so it puts you at higher risk. And then history of infection with previous cesarean, benefit, um, less chance of uterine rupture or an emergency c-section. So signs of uterine rupture, it's a dramatic onset set of fetal bradycardia or deep variable D cells. So you'll see that the baby's baseline has dropped below 110 or you'll see those variables, those dip downs, um, meaning that the baby is in distress. Reports by the woman that she had this popping sensation in her abdomen, extreme pain for the mother. It is extremely painful. Unrelenting uterine contraction followed by just disorganized uterine pattern increased fetal station felt upon the exam, all of a sudden that baby dropped down real quick. Um, easily palpable fetal parts, you can feel the baby through the abdomen walls, and then the mother will quickly begin showing signs of maternal shock. Low blood pressure, really high heart rate, feeling just terrible, um, very dizzy, kind of foggy headed, you'll see all these signs. Nursing care, it's outside the scope of an LVN to care for a labor room woman who has had a pre previous history of a cesarean delivery. The RN will always be in charge of that. Um, especially trained LVNs may function as a scrub nurse in cesarean, if the cesarean becomes necessary. Okay, that's all for this chapter.